last, uh, it's been a while. I haven't been here in a while. And uh, you haven't written, you haven't called. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's all right, I'm forgiving. Um, but I watched your service last week. Sunday mornings is a morning that um, I usually spend like just the whole day with the Lord, just communing. And um, I watched the service live and I said, man, this guy sounds like a little bit like a messianic rabbi. And the crazy thing is, I'm going to sound like a Baptist preacher today. <laughs> really, it's, it's just kind of funny. We talked about this yesterday. But um, I'm not going to give you anything culturally Jewish. You know, I really appreciate that Dr. Dean teaches in a, in a cultural context because, look, let's face it, the Bible is written by Jews, you know, to Jews in a Jewish place. So you've got to understand the culture. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, you won't, you know, understand it hermeneutically. No, no question about it. But I want to give you a little Jewish culture. In the Jewish world, children vie for their mother's heart. They want to be their favorite. You know how like nice people say, well, I don't have a favorite. I have four kids, I have a favorite, and they all know it, okay? I have a golden child. But that's a Jewish thing. So my mother passed away a few years ago. My mother and I were like this. I want to honor her memory. When she was 80 years old, my two sisters and I bought her gifts. So my sister, my older sister, Helene, buys her like one of these home entertainment centers with the best sound and the, be the best of everything. My other sister buys her a treadmill, a treadmill, because she's an exercise nut. I buy an African gray parrot. Now, I don't even know what African gray parrot. They have a vocabulary up to 10,000 words. And I teach this parrot the Torah. If you say to the parrot, Genesis 1-1, the parrot will say, in the beginning, I mean, So my mother, you know, she's, she's a New York Jew, you know, she's very honest and open, shoots from the hip. She writes us a letter of thanks and she writes to my darling children, I can't thank you enough for the gifts, but you know your mother, I have to be honest with you. Helene, I can't even see, I can't hear, what am I going to do with the home entertainment system? <laughs> Michelle, I can't even get out of bed, what am I going to do with the treadmill? But my son, always so practical, just knows what mother loves. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> And that's my mama. So, um, Dr. Dean, I was supposed to come here in January, but uh, three aneurysms held me up a little bit, so I didn't get to come. But um, Dr. Dean had asked me about a month prior to come and speak, and um, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to speak on. And, you know, look, I've spoken, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sermons. If you visit someplace, I don't speak anymore, out anymore. We, we live stream and I visit. You know, we have congregations in India and, and Perth, Australia, and Nakuru, Kenya, and Israel. So I have to visit them. So I, I just don't go out anymore to, to churches and speak, really. I just don't. And um, so I could probably come here and dust something off you know, and bring some really cool Jewish stuff that nobody knows, and everybody would be like, wow, that's cool, but that's not cool. I really, you know, try hard to seek the Lord every week, you know, at the synagogue, but what, Lord, you know me, just tell me what you want me to say, I'll say whatever you want, but I got to hear from you, like, come on. So I think I've got something, and then Dr. Dean kind of confirmed it when we were driving, he's telling me that he feels like revival is coming to this area. And let me just say this to you, okay? I have studied every revival from 632 B.C. in the days of King Josiah to the present. And God is always looking to revive His children. Always. Every day. All day. Okay? But it's conditional. It's conditional. If my people, then I will. So it's, there's a human side to this. And so it's more than available if you'll do your part. It's just that simple. And I think this message, it, it, it's not directly to do it revival, but I think, I think there's something, I think there's something to it maybe. I, at least I hope so. I'm, I'm trying my best. Anyway, so let's, I only have about five screens. Let's go to the first screen. In Matthew 22, this is pretty much the end of Jesus' ministry, okay? He's coming to the tail end. 
he talks to the pastors of his day in the next chapter and tells them where they're falling short. And then Matthew 24, 25, he speaks about the signs of the ends of the age, and then he's taken away. So this is the tail end. You want to get somebody at the tail end, okay? You want to get them at the tail end because they're going to say something very important. And he had just silenced the Sadducees. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were antagonistic towards each other. They didn't get along. A lot like Christians today. We have denominations and we don't necessarily get along. We say we do, but let's be honest. You know, there's, it, sometimes it creates barriers, it creates walls. I can't, I can't tell you, people call me a Messianic Jew, okay. They call me a Christian. I, I don't know what you want to call me. Am I a Jew who believes in Jesus? Then I'm a Messianic Jew. Do I follow Christ? Then I'm a Christian. Listen, guys, I don't refer to myself as that. I'm a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you go, no, I'm a believer in God. No. I go to India, okay? There are 1.1 million gods there. So if you say you believe in God, you believe in Jesus. He's just one of the 1.1 million. You follow? You got you to talk about who you're attached to. I'm a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the shed blood of his prophesied Messiah, Yeshua. <laughs> and if you ask me what church I go to, I never say Beth Yeshua. Oh, because you call it a synagogue? No, because it's not. I'm the church. You're the church. You're going to get that through your head. You fellowship at a fellowship. Is the local church important? Yes, it's biblical. But you are the church. You, you are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go, it goes. And you got to kind of get that mindset because that's what Jesus said. He's the head. We're the body. You can't, look, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't homeless. He had plenty of places. Think his mother had no home? He chose to be on a mission. But what he was really trying to say to us is, I can only put my head on one body. And we need to get that message badly. Now, the Pharisees, and I told people earlier, a lot of people think there was like a dozen Pharisees. There was 6,500 Pharisees in Israel. And not all of them was as bad as we think. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Okay? Paul, in the book of Acts, he didn't say I was a Pharisee. He said I am a Pharisee. A Pharisee is supposed to be a separated one, one that's holy unto God. We should be a Pharisee. Maybe not a hypocritical one. For that matter, a believer is one that's separated unto God, right? We are holy unto God, right? Separated from the world. So they come to him and they ask him a legitimate question, a lawyer. Not Jesus, have you been injured in a car accident? A lawyer in the first century was an expert in the laws of God. Just an expert in the 613 commands, okay? And he comes to him and he says, which is the most important commandment? Now, I shared earlier, some people believe there aren't least and greatest commandments. There absolutely are. Because if there wasn't, wouldn't he say, why do you ask such a question? All the commandments are important. No. Tithing your, mil di di your mint, dill, and cumin is not as important as faith, justice, and mercy. He said so in Matthew 23, correct? He was saying, that's least. Should you do the least? Yes, but don't forget what's most important. Are there least and greatest in the kingdom? Yes, we're going to sit at the judgment seat of Christ. He's coming back in his Father's glory and his recompense is with him to give according to what we've done. Is it a salvation issue? No, that's the great white throne. It has nothing to do with that. But are they going to be least and greatest in commandments in the kingdom? Yes. How do I know? Because Jesus said so. He said so in Matthew 5 out of his mouth. Are there least and greatest sins? Yes. People say all sin is sin. True, all sin is sin. But clearly, a kid that takes gum from a store and a serial rapist isn't the same, is it? So he says, which is the greatest commandment? He doesn't flinch. He doesn't have to think. He doesn't have to think not just because he's the Son of God. I wouldn't have to think. If you ask me what's the greatest commandment, easy. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Period. That's it. If you and I could absolutely fall head over heels in love with God and love Him with all our heart, meaning our affections, our motivations. That's the heart. The soul is the seat of your emotions. It's your decision maker. We make decisions all the time. If I could decide to please the Lord all the time, if my affections are for the Lord all the time, if, if my mind, my thinking, 
my, my motivations are for the Lord, if I use all my strength for the Lord. Man, I don't got to read a book on how to be a good husband. <laughs> are you kidding me? That will take care of itself. I'm not going to read a book on how to evangelize. It will just happen. It will just happen. You abide in Him, He abides in you, Holy Spirit moves and it happens. And when it's the Holy Spirit, it's beautiful. And when it's not the Holy Spirit, it's ugly. Ugly and abusive sometimes. So he says, that's the most, this is the most important commandment. We are commanded in the Bible to love the Lord. Commanded all over the Bible. Now look, I, look, I've said this, I don't want to be offensive, but there are some people that are married and they stay together because they're Christians. Yuck. I love Bernadette. I love Bernadette. I love Bernadette. I love Bernadette. I like to hang out with her. I like to be with her. She makes me laugh. She loves me. Thank God. It's great. It's fantastic. I don't feel obligated. It's a delight to do for her. It's, I lo when you love somebody, you want them to be happy. People always say in a relationship, you know what the most important thing is? Effective communication. <laughs> you read it in every book, right? Let me tell you something. You could effectively communicate. not like the person you're communicating with. If your spouse isn't making you laugh and you're not making your spouse laugh, something's wrong. If you get to the point where they can't make you laugh, you resent them. Not healthy. Not healthy. So it's nice when you, when you love somebody so much that you just want to do for them. You want to make them happy, right? My golden child, I told you I have four. I have a golden child. Dad, what can I do for you today? What? What kid says that? I mean, how many of us say, Father, what can I do for you today? How can I, you know, maybe take some load off of your shoulders? What do you need? It's beautiful. And listen, I honor people that are obedient. I do, even if it's begrudgingly. You know, it says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Let me tell you something. He'll take your money even if you're miserable, and he'll use it for his purposes. <laughs> but you won't get the blessing. But it's nice when you just want to obey God because you love to. Like he's calling, who will do it? And you're like, pick me. I'll do it. I'll go. I'll go. And you're happy to go. Not, oh, I'll go. I'll be obedient. Fine. Man. So we can agree, right? I hope. Um, well, it doesn't matter. I got the mic, right? So it doesn't matter. What, what do you think? But I think white, black, educated, uneducated, uh, Baptist, I was going to say Episcopalian, but no, that won't work anymore, right? But across denominational lines, we are called to love God, right? That's a given. And if I could take it a step further, we are all called to be like Jesus. That's a given, right? So, so how do we love Jesus? And in another gospel, at the end of the ministry in John 14, he gives the answer. It's, it's a saint. Just, hey, if you love me, you'll kind of do what I say, right? How many of us want, how many, oh, daddy, mommy, I love you. Well, if you love me, you'd listen to me. Isn't that the same thing, just without that attitude? It's just very logical, you know, and this is at the end of his ministry. Last will and testament, John 14, 15, 16, last word. There were no chapters. We put in the chapters so we could teach. But it's not like Jesus said, let's take a break, let's go to lunch, and we'll do John 15 when we get back. <laughs> it was just one last will and testament, then John 17, 26 verses of a prayer. Just a prayer, and then he's taken away to be crucified. So he says, look, don't tell me you love me, and don't honor me. Look, you don't, can't love me with your tears. Oh, Jesus, I love you, I love you. Then just obey me. It's through obedience. I know it's not a popular word today. Thank God I'm in a very conservative area, and thank God I'm in a First Baptist. But today, obedience, like, that's like obedience to a millennial is like kryptonite to Superman. <laughs> what? It's insane. It's insane what's happening. I really believe, I don't tell you this too often, I never tell my congregation what I think because it doesn't matter what I think. I'm just a teacher of the Word. It doesn't matter. 
I mean, and by the same token, it really doesn't matter what you think. I'll listen to it, but we got to get God's perspective. You got to know the word, man. You got to get into it. You got to know it. You got to know what God's saying, and you got to know how God sees things. So all I'm going to tell you is what I truly believe is the best way to obey God is to fall in love with him. Now, I know that there's Christians that have never fallen in love with God. I know there are people here right now, not because I'm prophetic, because it's just a given, that are not totally head over heels in love with Jesus. They might love him, but something got in the way. And it happens. Guys, it doesn't mean you're a lousy believer or you're unsaved. This is not a message of condemnation. It's a message of restoration. And that's God is a restorer. It even says in the Bible, you who are spiritual, restore. So if you're not restoring, you're not spiritual. I absolutely uh, fell in love with God 30 years ago on the Transfiguration Mountain in Israel. I won't get into the story, but bottom line is I was on my honeymoon, I saw a vision, and boom, it happened. I was born again, regenerated. I saw the Lord risen, totally glorified, and it was very radical. It wasn't like, well, cut off the music, cut off this, cut off that. It was unbelievable. It was like a Pauline experience. It really was. But recently in a hospital in Atlanta, I fell in love with the Lord all over again. But it wasn't the risen Lord, it was the suffering servant. And I didn't see him glorified, I saw him crucified. It was really wacky. And after that, I spent 40 days in the Lord's presence, and I wouldn't leave the cross. And it's really changed me, really changed me. And I pray I, I maintain that change, because that's how beautiful it's been. I have, um, I have vascular disease some genetic freaky thing where I don't have certain collagen, so I get aneurysms. You know what aneurysms are? For you kids that might not know, it's, it's like where you have a weakness in your artery, and if it pops, you have 90 seconds to live. 90 seconds. And I have, by the way, I was contacted by the Guinness Book. I have, I've survived the largest aneurysm in medical history, 12 by 8 centimeters, but I did not choose to go in. I mean, you know, you want your kids saying, my dad could do the most push-ups, not, my dad has the biggest aneurysm. <laughs> so I was like, nope, no thanks. But um, I don't know what happened. You know, I told Dr. Dean, maybe, you know, Psalm 139 says the Lord knits us in our mother's womb. Maybe he was knitting me and knitting me, and Gabriel called him, and he just, you know, the, the needle just went. Whoosh. I don't know, but I've had a lot of surgeries, and this last one was, wow, man, they put so many stents in me. Thank God it wasn't an open one, but yeah, stents in my aorta, stents in my iliac, um, yes, yeah, totally stented out. And it was a long surgery. I had to go to a very special surgeon because not too many people wanted to do it. And um, when I was recovering, they put me in a room and they said, you can't move for 24 hours. And the pain was pretty intense, but I wouldn't take painkillers. Not necessarily because I'm a tough guy, I wouldn't take them because the last time I took them, I aspirated. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's where the fecal matter that's supposed to come out of you goes up your esophagus, down your trachea, and into your lungs, right? And it's usually lights out. So I left the hospital 18 days after ICU in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. Oxygen is a bad deal. So I just wouldn't take it. But I can't lay on my back because I have disc issues, so I can't. I can't sleep on my back. I can't lay on my back for two minutes. So I had to lay there like this. And the pain started to get really, 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 really excruciating. And um, I heard a voice, and the voice said, the pain could stop if you just stop. And I knew it wasn't God. I knew it was the enemy. Can the enemy do that? Yes, he's the God of this world. Didn't he do it to Jesus? Not that I'm Jesus, but didn't he do it to him? He said, I can give you the kingdoms if you just bow to me. He has that power. I'm here to tell you, hand to God, it was very tempting. I've been doing this a long time, preaching the gospel, 30 years. I'm like, you know what? I, I'm tired. I'm tired of being attacked. I'm tired of being misunderstood. Fine. Because I was out of my mind. You know, I'm not on painkillers. I just had this big surgery. I tried to just turn to alleviate the pain, and on the wall, staring me in the face, is a crucifix. The hospital that I was at is called St. Joe's Hospital, and St. Joe's was founded by a Catholic order. Catholic order! God can use anything. 1880, the Sisters of Mercy. 
So no offense, I know a lot of Protestant churches have crosses, and it's a sign of Christianity, right? It's a sign of triumph, the empty cross, but the cross was never empty. The tomb was empty. I mean, truth be told, we should have an empty tomb if we want to talk about the resurrection. But you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. The resurrection gives us great hope for our resurrection, but we're not saved by the resurrection. There's no remission of sin without blood. So this thing is talking to me. I'm done. I don't know what happened, but I was crying so loud that the nurses came in. It was inconsolable weeping and wailing. It was at that moment that I realized my sins yelled crucify. It wasn't the sins of the world. It was me, me, it was personal. And all, I, all that was coming out of me was, I'm so sorry I did this to you. I was crushed, crushed. And all I kept hearing him say, like his mouth was moving on the cross was, just in pain, I love you, Greg. I love you. And it made me do it more. I'm so sorry. I love you. Do you know how diametrically opposed that is? Can you imagine betraying somebody so horrifically and you finally come to grips with that and you come to them and you know they're not going to forgive you and they shouldn't and you're not looking for it. You're just to alleviate some pain from your own heart and you confess to them and they go, I love you. Like, you know how crazy that is? And so you couldn't take me three feet from the cross after that. And it was, it was our sins, man. It was our grief. Look at Isaiah 53, just two verses. Our pains. Personalize it. Make it my, my you know, my pains you suffered. My sins, my crimes. Man. I mean, I've studied the crucifixion from a medical perspective, really intense. I have a few friends that are doctors, and man, awful. The most intense pain for the longest duration. I was thinking in that time, like, no nurses to attend him, no pain medicine, no climate controlled room to sit in. And then I was thinking more. I was thinking the whole day, like, man, I went through a little pain so I wouldn't bleed out. He went through a tsunami of pain to bleed out. What? The dichotomy was crazy. You know, in, in Jesus' day, the Jewish people, they wanted signs. They just show us enough signs and we'll believe. The Gentiles, they loved knowledge, human reasoning and logic. Philosophers were national heroes. And Paul was brilliant. I don't know if you know how brilliant he is, but Peter spoke in his letter and said, Paul's so brilliant that if you are not a hermeneutical genius, there's no way you can understand what he says in his letters. By the way, side note, side note, I know you're well schooled, but there is a way to interpret scripture. There are five principles. The most important principle is context. You cannot, sir, read me a verse in Galatians and tell me what it means without reading the letter from start to finish. Who wrote the letter? Who was it written to? Who's the recipient? Where was the person when they wrote it? Where is Galatia? Did they have a visit Galatia? What's going on in the person's life? What's going on in the recipient's life? You will never understand the letters. Never. Now, Paul was brilliant. He was handpicked by Gamaliel, who studied under Hillel, to be his personal disciple. Out of all the Jews in the diaspora, IQ off the charts, brilliant. And he knew the Jews wanted signs. He knew the Gentiles wanted knowledge. And he said, I'm not catering to any of that. I'm coming here. It's so powerful that I'm just going to preach the cross. And the Lord's going to move, and it's up to you to do something about it. He wouldn't cater. He wasn't going to give an oratory or give eloquence. Nope. Not for him. But the crazy thing is, what they were looking for, the Jews wanted somebody to put down Rome. And you can understand, it was promised in the Bible. Put down on our presses, right? And the Greeks, the Gentiles, love wisdom. So the Jews wanted the power of God. 
The Gentiles wanted the wisdom of God, and guess what? In the cross, you get the power of God and the wisdom of God, just people don't see it. Let me, let me explain. Let me explain the way I see it anyway. Jesus is dealing with betrayal. I wrote this down this morning. Betrayal, abandonment, pain, torture, sadness, rejection, unmerited punishment, false accusations, judgment, and discrimination. That's a lot. That is a lot to deal with. You think you're having a bad day. And at the same time, in the midst of all this, he is fully divine, but he is fully human. Okay? Fully human. Experiences everything we're experiencing. He's experiencing this. It's real. And yet, he has access to an angelic host. Now, do you, do you know about angels in the Bible? There are messenger angels, but there are warrior angels, like a Gabriel and a Michael. There are angels over areas and cities and nations. But angels are macho men. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, people hit the deck. So these aren't angels that you get at Bed Bath & Beyond, okay? <laughs> if I see an old bald man with wings and a harp, I'm not hitting the deck. These are macho men, and he says, I can call 12 legions. Why 12? He can call 100 legions. 12 is just a number in Hebraic reasoning, Hebraic understanding of power and authority. He's saying, I have all power and all authority. I can call all the heavenly host. But he uses 12. Now, what are 12, the exact number? 12 legions. A legion is 60 centurions. That's 72,000 macho men. Four angels in the book of Revelation, four hold back the winds. Two angels in Genesis blind the, all the men of Sodom. Two! What do you think 72,000 could do? Do you know what it takes to restrain, to holster your weapon? Do you know how much power was in that? That's the power of God. Guys, if that's not enough, where he just goes, nope, like a sheep being sheared, he was silent. That would be enough, I say dianu in Hebrew. It's enough. But then he does something over the top, and he says, Father, like begging the Father, Father, forgive them. Now, did the Father want him to forgive? Of course. He smiled. That's my boy. Didn't Moses do the same thing? The people Pain were in the neck. I'm telling you, I know my people. But you're grafted in, so you're just as big as a pain in the neck as they are. <laughs> people are people. And didn't God say, Moses, let's take him out and start over. You deserve better. Maybe if that was you, you would have said, okay. But Moses said, no, Father, no. Please forgive them or I'm not going. Wow. And God was like, yes, yes. Way to go. It said it pleased the father to crush the son. It pleased him to crush. Is he sadistic? No, so he would see his offspring. That's you and me. It's crazy love. Crazy love. And then Jesus says, Father, forgive them. What? I mean, can anybody, is anybody a mathematician? If you are, can you calculate for me the Niagara of God's wrath that was averted by that prayer? I'd like to know. The power of God is his love and his mercy and forgiveness. There's nothing more powerful in the universe. Why is the cross the wisdom of God? Well, God is holy and God is love. He's holy and he's love. That's his two pillars. Holy is hard to explain. No theologian could understand it. We say perfect. It's so far beyond that. God is holy. You just have to hit the deck. That's all. Don't say anything. You know? We worship God. Now, praise is different than worship. I tell people that all the time. You can praise your son, you can praise your dog, but you can't worship them. You can only worship God. Amen. So, when you talk about God being holy, He's holy. He's holy. He can't brush sin under the rug. It can't be overlooked. Ezekiel 18 makes it clear. No son of man. I can't just overlook it, because if I overlook it, that's not just. That's not holy. But if I let them pay for the sin, then everybody go, where's the love, right? 
He's backed up in a corner. How is he going to do this? How is he going to pull this off? Everybody's yelling for justice today, right? Think about sin. Do you know how many people sin and have compromised that it's not sin? The Bible speaks in Psalm 19 about presumptuous sins. You know what that is? Those are sins that we don't even realize are sins. Sins of commission are easy. What about sins of omission? How many times you pass somebody by and go, somebody else will take care of them? You know, if you compare yourself to Jack the Ripper, you're pretty good. But if you compare yourself to Jesus the Christ, hmm, chasm. That's all plumb line. That's all plumb line. So why is the cross the wisdom of God? Because somebody's got to pay, and somebody did pay. And at the cross, God's justice was satisfied. His mercy was exemplified, and his great name, as always, was glorified. Hallelujah. Now here's the message. Here's the message, I think, for you guys and for any guys that calls himself a believer. So it's not just the first Baptist of Morristown message. This is a message for the body of Messiah. In Revelation 2, God is speaking to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey. They're actual seven real congregations. It's not symbolic or figurative. There's a lot of allegory in the Bible, but this isn't one of them. And the first church up is Ephesus. Now, I have three verses and then two, and we're done. In these three verses, it's not John. I know we call it the Revelation or the Apocalypse according to John. No, Jesus is talking. I'm a big fan of what he says. I don't believe it's the Gospel according to the Apostle Paul. I'm a big fan of his words. You know, his words are very simple, very straightforward. He preached one sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. If you ask me, how do I be a good believer? Walk out the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Kingdom Manifesto. It's the Constitution of the Kingdom. Simple. You're saved. That's, that's, your, that's, that's the rights and responsibilities within the Kingdom. We, we, want, we want the rights. No weapon formed against me. We don't really like the responsibilities. You know, we talk about immigration. They come illegal. You know, they want all the rights, but they don't want the responsibilities. Okay, I get it. You're right. But how about when God says that to you? So here's this church at Ephesus, and this is what he says. The one who holds the seven stars, those are the angels, the lampstands are the actual churches. And Paul and John, and nobody does that. Jesus is in a class of his own, okay? I got news for you. We're supposed to be Christ-like, but there's only one Christ. Amen. Make no mistake, he was full of grace and full of truth. That means thoroughly honest, not compromising evil 100% of the time, and 100% of the time he delved out unmerited favor to all. Crazy, man. I'm trying. I'm telling you, I promise you, I'm, I'm trying with all I got. He says, I know what you have been doing. I know, the Lord. First of all, that's a good sign, because there's people that aren't doing nothing. They're reading. They're reading. They read all the time. They read all the time. Like, like God's going to give them a test or something when he go to the judgment seat of Christ. He says, I know you've been doing. That's good. We should be doing. Right? Occupied till he comes. you got a whole eternity to hang out. How hard you have worked. They're, they're, working, they're, not just, they're working hard. They've persevered. Why are they persevering? In the first century, everybody was persecuted. Not if, it's when and how bad. Their property was confiscated, they couldn't hold jobs, they were imprisoned, tortured, and beaten, and even killed. So, and they're not just backing off, they're not just giving up, they're saying, bring it on. Blessed are the persecuted. This is the kingdom of heaven. They're pressing, man. <laughs> we know how you can't stand wicked people. Hate what God hates. God hates evil. You tested those. You've tested the spirits. You're not tolerating it. Church discipline, where did that go? <laughs> Some guy divorced his wife, and what do you tell him? Well, just go to the latest service. Get out of here. Go to the latest service. It's crazy. Where's the discipline anymore? You found them to be liars. Good. You are persevering. You have suffered without growing weary. If you read that, you'd go, that's a dynamic church, man. That's a dynamic church. If you read my resume about what Bethany Shoe is doing, I'm not going to boast, but you'd be like, there's no way a place that small could be doing what they're doing. Impressive. However, here's the but. 
Look at the next screen. Last one. But I have this against you. I have this against you. You've lost the love you had at first. How many people are married 25, 30 years and they're not acting like they were on their honeymoon? Therefore, remember where you fell. Now, some might say, well, Rabbi, this, this is a shame, right? No. Jesus calls it a sin. That's a big difference. A shame is just sad, but a sin is separation from God. From where you fell, turn from this sin and do what you did before. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. That's not good. What does that mean? You won't occupy the place of a church. You have no light if you don't turn from your sin. Now look, this is not a message of condemnation. No way. There is no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua. It's a message of restoration. Restoration. You who are spiritual, restore. If you have never, I told Dr. Dean a story uh, this morning when we were upstairs. I was at a Presbyterian church first time. A very, Presbyterians are known to be very intelligent usually. First Presbyterian in Orlando, okay? I call them the frozen chosen. <laughs> are there any Presbyterians here? I'm sorry. Anyway, so very brilliant, very brilliant. And I, I felt the need to have an altar call. This was the first time I ever spoke in a church. But I didn't know what an altar call was. So I went to the pastor and I was like, I think I need to, Dr. Brinkhoff, I think I need to. He goes, just do what's on your heart. So a lady comes up, 80 years old, 80, I found this out of effect, weeping and weeping. We went to have lunch in this big fellowship hall and she came up to me, she goes, Rabbi, I have to talk to you. She goes, I've been going to church since I'm eight, 72 years, I've never heard the Holy Spirit. I heard it today. I turned to my husband, I said, now forgive my French, but I turned to my husband and said, I'm going up. He said, the hell you are, you will not embarrass me. She said, I'm going up. And she went up she said, I just want you to know something. I feel eight years old all over again. She was born again, yeah. truly born again. So it don't matter if you're in the church 72 years, okay? It doesn't matter, okay? You got to be born again. And if you are born again, I'm here to tell you, I know there's at least one person, because I didn't come for nothing. There's at least one person here who needs to be born again again and fall head over and heels in love with Jesus. So at this point, because I'm not the gatekeeper and because I have all the respect in the world for Dr. Dean, I'm going to let him come up and take over.